right, thank you, Kelvin. So we are going to go right ahead into our session. We have six exciting presentations for everyone here. So we will start off and introduce uh, Morgan Philbin. Dr. Morgan Philbin is a social and behavioral scientist whose work explores how social structural factors impact health outcomes for vulnerable populations. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, perfect. So thank you so much for all of you. For, sorry, I'm just going to check what time it is to make sure I behave. Um, so thank you so much for coming to the session. And I'm definitely both excited to be presenting and excited to see what the rest of my presenters have to say. So I'm also, it's always nice when you actually have to attend the sessions you would see anyway. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a study that I did where, with actually some colleagues who are in the room. Amanda, raise your hand, who led the study that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and so we were looking at the association between incarceration and transactional sex for HIV positive young men who have sex with men in the United States. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest. And just before I start, I did want to say thank you to a lot of the collaborators on the study, of whom there are many. This came through the Adolescent Trials Network. So if any of you who worked on trials know, there are always more people than you can thank. Um, and so in addition to the collaborators, also the funders, uh, which was NICHD, and then the support I have from NIDA. So as a quick background, and this probably will not be surprising to you given what has been going on in the United States over the last, well, I mean, 250 years, but in the media more prominently in the last two or three years, that criminal justice disproportionately impacts people of color and also disproportionately impacts sexual and gender minorities. And so this actually happens not only in terms of who comes in contact with the system at all, but also once people are in the system. So once people are incarcerated, um, and then in terms of outcomes in probation, that there are, there tend to be worse experiences and they're disproportionately incarcerated. Um, and then also, in addition to that, there are a lot of different sexual risk behaviors that can occur as a result of being incarcerated. And so this can mean that, for example, sexual networks are disrupted when somebody is incarcerated. Um, or when you come out, as some of you know who are from the United States, you are oftentimes unable to access certain services. So you no longer have access to housing, which can then obviously disrupt who you may be spending time with or how you have access to a place to sleep. Um, and so as a result of this, we were interested to look at incarceration and transactional sex because while some work has looked at incarceration and sexual risk more broadly, um, no, studies hadn't actually looked specifically at incarceration and transactional sex, which obviously is likely cyclical, which we realized though for this study the data were cross-sectional. Um, and so the goal of this was to actually look at that relationship because, and this is also something that you'll see, is transactional sex is hard to measure. So when we looked at the literature, the range that we saw among studies that had interviewed young MSM about transactional sex was that it was 6 to 44% reported it. And some of this, as any of you know who do survey research, may have to do with how the question was asked. It could have to do with the city within which someone lived. It could be that someone was like, you know, thought, well, I'm sleeping on their couch, and then I had sex with them, but that, is that transactional sex? Whereas some researchers may say it is and some not. So, but given the wide range, we thought this is definitely something important to explore. Um, and so the methods, these data came from a study that was called the Comprehensive Assessment of Transition and Coordination for HIV-Infected Youth as they move from adolescent to adult care, which not surprisingly we called CATCH because that is a lot of words to try and remember. Um, and that study was looking at how HIV-positive adolescents transition from adolescent to adult care. So the eligibility criteria for that study was that an adolescent be at least 18 and be within three months or planning to tra transition within three months. So it basically meant we had a group of individual, of young MSM who were 18 to 24 who came from 14 different clinical sites across the U.S. And they were recruited from 2015 to 2016. And in the end, we ended up with a sample of about 100. And so when the youth came in at baseline, they provided informed consent, and then they completed an ACASI survey, so an audio computer-assisted self-interview, which we did because we were afraid that if we were actually interviewing people face-to-face, -face, they may be more reticent to disclose certain behaviors. And so we had them do it with a computer, and that we asked questions around psychosocial characteristics and medical and behavioral history, and then we also had medical records that we could extract for other information such as viral load and CD4. Um, and so the main outcomes of interest included asking about history of incarceration, so ever been in jail or prison. We also asked about last three months, but thank goodness the N was quite low. 
Um, and we also ask about transactional sex, which for the purposes of this study was defined as ever having exchanged sex for money or drugs. And then statistically, we did a multivariate logistic regression to look at that association. So I know that the table isn't that large, so I'm just going to talk you through the main demographic characteristics of the men that we looked at. So the majority, about 75%, were 24. So the sample was definitely more on the 24 um, side versus the 18. They were nearly all racial and ethnic minority individuals. And the majority were not in school um, and were single. And then over 60% earned less than $12,000 a year. So this is definitely a marginalized, relatively unstable sample, particularly since nearly half had um, been homeless at some point in their lives. Um, and this, again, unfortunately, for those of you who do work in the United States with this population, it's not going to be surprising to you that 40% had ever been incarcerated, but it is staggering. And I do want to take a moment to recognize that and that this sample, I mean, it's not a national level sample by any means, but it does come from 14 different sites across the US, and this is what we're seeing. So this is a hugely disruptive moment in the lives of these young men. And then similarly, a third had engaged in transactional sex, which is right in the middle of the data I reported earlier, which was 6 to 44%. So this is definitely um, a population that is unstable and just dealing with a lot of structural um, barriers in their lives. So then what we did when we ran the multivariate model is we found that having ever been incarcerated was independently associated with transactional sex. And you can see the odds ratio is around three, as was being 24 years old, which I can talk about a little bit, but we f being 24 years old versus younger. And some of that is just over time, as you have more options to have engaged in transactional sex. Um, and then being homeless. So again, based on what we know that, you know, if you don't have a place to live, sometimes you will have to sleep with somebody in order to have somewhere, because a lot of the people that we've talked to in other studies qualitatively will say that particularly for men, the homeless shelters are quite unsafe spaces. And so for them, it's actually better to either be on the streets or to sort of be unstably housed with friends than to actually enter the homeless shelter system. So in sum, one of the things that we found is that incarceration by itself, as opposed to previous studies that have looked at these sort of cumulative life stressor models, um, is actually something that did matter for these young men. And particularly, I want to point out that these young men were really facing a lot of intersecting marginal, uh, marginalized identities. So thinking of the sort of syndemics model or this intersectionality, that these men that we worked with were HIV positive, they slept with other men, and they were racial and ethnic minorities. So there are a lot of different factors in their lives for which they can be stigmatized and targeted by the criminal justice system. And as a result, that this places them at higher risk for transactional sex, which for many of them was simply a survival tool. Um, and I also want to note again that this is not occurring in isolation. This is not something the youth are sort of doing independently of the world in which they live. And that a lot of these adolescents, you know, are coming up in cities where high school graduation rates are 50, 60 percent. It is incredibly hard in the U.S. as a young black man to find stable employment that is going to offer any sort of stability that is not regulated by shift work um, and that is going to offer health insurance. And so as a result of these intersecting structural factors, there are a lot of things that can cause these men to engage in these types of behaviors. And I also want to talk about, too, given the fact that Jeff Sessions is our attorney general, the way that policies are shifting around substance use and incarceration and criminalization in the United States, that I don't have a lot of faith that we're going, that things are getting better at the rate we're going. And so just really thinking about the way that even if we can look at policies at a city level, I mean, I live in New York City, so I realize that I am really blessed to live at a really deep blue dot. Um, <laughs> but just thinking about what we can do where we can for the moment, and so to really see if there are things that we can shift, because the policies that are coming up around substance use disproportionately target people of color and also uh, racial and, or sorry, excuse me, gender and sexual minority youth. So in conclusion, we just wanted to point out with this research the importance of thinking of this relationship between incarceration and sexual risk more broadly, but particular transactional sex as a key point of health disparities that can be driving some of the HIV risks that we talk about um, for young men who have sex with men. Um, and also thinking about more broadly that while there were some individual level factors associated in the model, some of the structural things like homelessness are also more likely what is driving a lot of this challenge and the policies that are related to the criminal justice system as well. Um, and so thinking about because these adolescents were HIV positive that we worked with, that whether there are some ways from a clinical perspective because 
these, by default of being in the study, were engaged in care in some level. So thinking about whether there are ways through the clinical system, whether it's engaging them with case management or social workers to help with things like getting a GED or getting access to housing or help even getting help paying with ins uh, excuse me, insurance or um, electricity, to think about if there are ways from a clinical perspective that we can help address it, even if it's sort of stopgap measures. So I just, I did hear that we're gonna wait, I think, for questions until the end. So no questions, but thank you guys very much. So thank you, Morgan, for your presentation and for keeping exactly to time. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, as she said, we will wait to the end of the session. So if you have questions for any speaker, kindly write them down and then we can uh, deal with the questions at the end of the session. So with that, we will introduce the next speaker, um, which is Danielle uh, Chiaramonti. And Danielle is a doctoral student at the Michigan, Michigan State University's Ecological Community Psychology Program. Her work broadly focuses on structural change, promotion of health and wellness, and increasing access to resources for individuals at risk for or are living with HIV. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, thank you all for letting me present today. I'm a first time conference attendee, so this is pretty exciting for me. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to, oh, sorry. I'd just like to thank uh, my colleagues at Michigan State University, and my work is also part of the Adolescent Trials Network, which you already heard Morgan discuss, so I won't have to repeat myself there. <laughs> uh, so, as we all know why we're all here today, the HIV epidemic among youth and adolescents is a serious public health concern. Specifically within the United States, one in four HIV infections occurs among youth, and about 60% of youth do not know that they are infected. Uh, because the bulk of the HIV epidemic in the United States does occur among young um, men who have sex with men, uh, programming and efforts targeted specifically towards young women are rare. Consequently, we lack a lot of empirical evidence about the social and structural inequalities that we know are putting young women at a higher risk for HIV. <coughs> Globally, of course, this is also true, and this was reinforced a lot at the opening ceremony on Monday. Uh, young girls are disproportionately affected by HIV because of gender-based inequalities, threats to their human rights, and, uh, and uh, social stigmas that really put them at high risk. So one of the leading theories uh, that has been applied to understand women's unique risks to HIV is, uh, focuses on the power dynamics in relationships. So Connell's theory of gender and power uh, reflects on women's socially unequal position relative to men and the ways in which social and political systems interact to constrain women's life choices and power. Specifically, Connell talks about three fundamental structures that characterize these gendered relationships. The first being sexual division of labor. And so this is sort of your socioeconomic factors, the ability to access, have, and control your own finances. The second structure is the sexual division of power. And this uh, refers to sort of power imbalances in relationships, uh, for example, engaging in relationships that a woman might easily be uh, uh, taken advantage of. And the third structure is what Connell calls cathexis, which refers to social norms that may limit access to information. So a great example of this in the United States is the conservative culture around uh, gender norms and sexuality education that make it very hard for women to learn about sexual education in this country. So, uh, in adult women, recent studies have examined different pieces of Connell's theory and found compelling evidence that powerlessness puts women at a higher risk for STDs, HIV, unplanned pregnancy, and reproductive coercion. But we lack a lot of empirical evidence on young women in particular. So this study, uh, informed by the theory of gender and power, had two specific goals. First, we wanted to model gender powerlessness in young women, and we wanted to see if we could fit an empirical model and then we wanted to evaluate if gendered powerlessness was associated with self-reported condom use with male partners. So to do so, we uh, used data we had previously collected from a larger multi-site community mobilization initiative through the Adolescent Trials Network. Uh, and one tiny piece of this huge community mobilization effort were anonymous interviews with high-risk youth in 14 of our uh, sites, which were in 14 US cities. And we use venue-based sampling to target youth from low-income urban neighborhoods with high rates of STIs and HIV. Participants were between the ages of 12 and 24 and had engaged in consensual sex in the last 12 months. 
Uh, we interviewed over 2,000 youth, but I'm only going to be speaking about the 1,000 uh, young cisgendered women who are primarily black and Hispanic. So the analysis had several steps, so bear with me. Uh, the first step was to determine the structure of gendered powerlessness in our sample. So uh, by that, I mean we took half of our female sample, our calibration sample, we called it, and we selected items from our interview that we thought reflected Connell's ideas of gender and power. And we subsequently ran an exploratory factor analysis to see if response patterns aligned with that theory. So we ended with 23 indicators and a three-factor solution uh, that did indeed reflect those uh, structures I talked about. So sexual division of labor, which are those economic factors, sexual division of power, which are power imbalances in relationships, and cathexis, which are social norms. Uh, we then, and that had really good model fit. We then ran a confirmatory factor analysis with the other half of our female sample, our validation sample, uh, to confirm this structure. Again, we had 22 indicators, so we dropped one because of a high correlation, uh, and a three-factor solution that, again, reflected Connell's ideas. Uh, and this had excellent model fit. So this lends support to the perspective that gendered powerlessness is multidimensional and consists of three clear and distinct latent constructs pertaining to economic control, power imbalances, and social norms. So our next step was to determine whether the structure was truly gendered. So we ran the analysis with the inclusion of the males in the sample. And this had very poor model fit. So this implies that the latent structure really only applies to the females in our sample and supports construct validity. Our final step was to see if gender powerlessness was associated with self-reported condom use. And so to do this, we did a structural equation model to test that relationship. Controlling for age, we found that two of the factors did predict condom use, uh, sexual division of power and cathexis. So as powerlessness increased, condom use declined. So in the, in the direction you might expect. Uh, the economic uh, structure was not significant, which is a little surprising because that's a pretty strong predictor in adult uh, female samples, especially in the context of abusive relationships. So that, um, that is something that warrants further investigation. But we think that might be that social norms and power dynamics in relationships may be more salient for young women. Uh, overall, this study resulted in three important findings. First, we empirically established a three-factor model of gender powerlessness for young women that not only reflects the theory but also includes age-appropriate items. Our second uh, finding was that we confirmed the gendered nature of HIV risk by testing the model with both boys and girls. And third, we established that two of the three latent factors predicted condom use, which suggests that effective strategies for improving condom use might just move beyond uh, increasing access to sexual health resources for girls but also normalizing female sexuality and acknowledging and addressing uh, power imbalances in sexual relationships. Moving forward, uh, we plan to continue to explore the specific needs of young women. Uh, particularly, we are interested in the, the intersection between intimate partner violence and HIV because power dynamics within uh, intimate partner violence relationships are, are especially salient. Additionally, we hope to explore gender powerlessness in gender nonconforming and transgender youth the latter of whom are particularly high risk for HIV and may experience unique forms of gender powerlessness. Finally, I'm sure many of you, these findings are nothing new, but, and so I wanna put my activist hat on for a second, <laughs> but <laughs> having a multi-dimensional empirical framework like this that pertains to gender and power specifically for young women, not only contributes to evolving theory, but also helps us have the evidence so that we can fund, implement, adapt, and sustain evidence-based programs that we need to address gender inequality and HIV in a relevant way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. And you also kept the time. You actually saved a couple of minutes. Um, so I'll hand over to my co-chair, uh, Kelvin Makura, to take over from here. Uh, thank you, Nadia. Um, to everyone who's just joined us, uh, welcome to our session. Uh, the session title is uh, called Time for a Youth Quake in HIV Prevention and Treatment. So we're actually looking at studies or interventions that were actually done by our colleagues and uh, what uh, innovations have they uncovered and what is actually there to actually we ensure, to make sure that we ensure there is HIV prevention and, and treatment for adolescents. Uh, young people um, in our diversity. So right now, I'm going to be introducing um, Dr. Ritu Agoral, 
who is from the United States of America. Uh, she is the Senior Associate Dean for Research, uh, a professor, and the Robert H. Smith Dean's Chair for, of Information Systems at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, uh, which, is in the which is the University of Maryland. And she is also the founder and director of the Center for Health Information and Decision Systems. So welcome to the session. And uh, she will actually be talking about um, one of her studies that she did where uh, they were actually doing an ethnographic study for HIV prevention, which reveals a, typ a typology consisting of five distinct types among Southern African adolescents and young women. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, I think I have the dubious distinction of being the only business school professor at this conference, so thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is the result of a study that we did over 12 months with a multidisciplinary team of scientists, and in fact, a study of this magnitude and this uh, depth uh, is not possible by a single discipline alone. So we have represented on our team biomedical scientists, social scientists, behavioral scientists, health services research, and a few business school faculty as well. Uh, what I'm going to be doing in the next 10 minutes is talking to you about the why, what motivated us to do this study, the what, what exactly we did, and how we did it, and then I'll spend five minutes or so giving you a preview of our findings. Unfortunately, I won't have all the time today to get into the depth of what we did, but I hope uh, I can give you enough information to pique your interest to find out more. So while we're here today, I have no conflicts of interest to report. We are here today because, as we've heard in the two days of this con conference, prevention of HIV is a priority. If we can get to the disease before it attacks anybody, we will be in a much better position to save lives. Uh, we heard in the news release this morning that by 2050, 10 million new infections are projected to occur in sub-Saharan Africa. And more than two-thirds of these infections are going to be incident amongst women. This clearly highlights the importance of research and studies that target this population that has been overlooked for a very long time. So that motivated us to do this study. When we look at the recent clinical trials that have been conducted amongst young women in sub-Saharan Africa, the VOICE trial and the ASPIRE trial, we learned that even though the drugs that were examined, the products that were examined in these studies were safe, they were not effective. And why were they not effective? Simply because the women that were being targeted by these products did not use them. Not only did they not use them, they also misreported their adherence to the study researchers. In fact, analysis of blood samples after the trials were over revealed that there was no drug in the blood even though 90% of them said they had taken all the doses. So two key insights emerged from these studies that motivated our research. First, adoption and sustained use of prevention products occurs in an extremely complex socioeconomic and uh, sociocultural setting. And unless we have a clear understanding of the experienced reality of these women in their day-to-day -day lives, we're only going to end up designing products that they don't want to use. Second, these are products that are deeply personal. They delve into issues of sexuality and stigma, and unless we can unpack the psychological and behavioral nuances that underlie product use, again, our product rollout activities, our product rollout efforts are not going to be successful. So this motivated us to embark on the study that I'm presenting today. Uh, we embarked on an extensive study using a mixed methods design, both qualitative and quantitative techniques. Today I will be presenting the results from our qualitative study. Our study was loosely titled uh, Pro uh, Promoting HIV Prevention Among Low-Income Women in South Africa, Behavioral, Sociological, and Product Marketing Opportunities and Challenges. Uh, we focused on three major metro areas, Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town. Our respondents were urban and peri-urban women, young women, girls and young women, in the living standards of measurement four to seven scale, which means they're somewhere in the middle of the socioeconomic spectrum. 
target uh, respondents were young black females aged 14 to 25 with subgroups 14 to 17 and 18 to 25 years old. Our qualitative data are extensive. Uh, we interacted with over 122, 122 women, which is a very large sample size for a qualitative study. We started with expert in-depth interviews where we spoke with 11 subject matter experts uh, ranging from public health officials uh, to sociologists to other scholars within South Africa who would give us some insights into the sociocultural context. We followed this up with 32 depnographies with young women where researchers immersed themselves in their lives for three days each. Then we took eight digitally savvy participants and asked them to maintain an online journal where they recorded all their thoughts, their emotions, and their activities. We followed that by hostess home groups where we observed interactions between the target respondents and their friends fully understanding that social interactions have a huge role to play in the promotion of prevention products. This was followed by in-depth interviews with 11 key influencers in these young girls' lives, which included their mothers, um, local community leaders, and village elders. And then, because we felt our understanding was still incomplete, we followed that up with six in-depth interviews in individually with the young women and then paired with their partners. So this is the corpus of data. Uh, we analyzed these data using a variety of qualitative techniques which are fundamentally predicated on inductive reasoning. We extracted uh, categories. We used content analysis to identify relationships. Uh, we examined all the concepts, the categories, and the relationships. And then we stepped back and synthesized everything that we had found. What we found in our qualitative study was five very distinct segments or categories of women that I'd like to describe next. We differentiated these women along two axes. On the x-axis is their risk of HIV infection based on understanding their sexual preferences, their sexual activities, and their behaviors. This ranges from low risk to high risk. On the y-axis is the spectrum of privilege that these women have. Those of you who are familiar with South Africa might be aware that this generation is currently undergoing, uh, is reaping the advantages of social mobility amongst their parents. And there's an immense variation in the socioeconomic privilege across these young women that we're trying to target. So this axis represents how much economic freedom, how much uh, economic strength, and in general social mobility these women have. Based on these two segments, we identified five distinct, based on these two, I'm sorry, based on these two, uh, these, uh, two axes, we identified five distinct segments of young women. And we labeled them based on their characteristics. The good girl and the liberated survivalist who fall within the privileged category. The good girl is at low risk and the liberated survivalist is at high risk. The responsible mother and the gender prisoner who are less socioeconomically privileged. The responsible mother is at low risk and the gender prisoner is at high risk. And then finally in the middle, we have a category that we labeled protection savvy, who are in the middle of both the socioeconomic spectrum as well as their risk of HIV prevention. Now, underlying this typology is uh, a set of six classes of factors that very clearly show the variation amongst these five types. So let me share with you in the next few slides what are the categories of factors <coughs> along which we differentiated these young women. Uh, I'm going to start with presenting some adjectives that describe these segments to bring them evocatively to life for you. So the good girl is innocent, she's religious, she's conservative, she's obedient, she's led a sheltered life, and she practices abstinence. The liberated survivalist, by contrast, is a socialite, she's trendy, she's confident, she engages in risky sex, and she's a party girl. The gender prisoner is powerless, exploited, irresponsible, has an unstable life, and an unstable home life, and she's at high risk. 
So we distinguish these women uh, on the basis of their sexual health and their partners. We distinguish them on their use of sexual health products. Again, as you can see from this chart, the responsible mother almost always uses condoms and the gender prisoner hardly ever uses them. Uh, we distinguish them on the basis of sexual, uh, excuse me, social and gender influences. Uh, and let me just underscore uh, the sharp contrast here. Uh, looking at how much influence there is from the media, we can see that the responsible mother has, is hardly affected by anything she sees in the media. And in contrast, the liberated survivalist is hugely affected by what she observes in the media. And she takes a lot of behavioral and social cues from whatever's hot and trendy in the media. The last uh, classes of distinguishing characteristics are the economic conditions and education. Uh, and unsurprisingly, as I had described in the two dimensions that distinguished our typology, again, we can see the good girl here is nearing economic freedom. She was on the left-hand side uh, in the uh, top left corner. So uh, along the socioeconomic privilege, she was doing well. And the gender prisoner is uh, struggling to survive. She faces a lot of challenges in her life. And the education also varies amongst them uh, with the gender prisoner uh, typically being the one who is the least educated. So let me now take a deeper dive into two of the categories, or two of the segments that we identified as being at highest risk for HIV infection. And therefore, these are the segments that we would like to target first with our prevention products. So let's look at the liberated survivalist. Who is she? This is a young woman who has multiple sexual partners, engages in transactional sex, has a lot of short-term relationships. She is likely to be in a relationship with a sugar daddy or a blesser uh, who expects sex from her in exchange for financial security, that is education or gifts. She loves to party, socialize, and have a good time, as long as she's in the right crowd who will give her the appreciation she feels she deserves. She's extremely confident in her sexuality, and she uses uh, being a woman to her advantage. For her, we would recommend, based on our study, that she be empowered with a covert STI prevention products. She should be able to access these products from clubs and tavern dispensers. Uh, we recommend that the communication and messaging around these products be about protecting yourself to engage in responsible yet fun sexual encounters. And the product packaging that is likely to, uh, to be attractive to these young women, the liberated survivalist, is something that's trendy, that's modern, that's feminine. In terms of social media influences, Instagram and YouTube are big in these young women's lives, so we would recommend messaging and promotion uh, through these two channels, and in fact, they are more popular than Facebook. So again, to summarize, the liberated survivalist is at high risk for HIV prevention, and she has HIV infection, and she has multiple and impulsive sexual encounters that make her vulnerable in the moment. The gender prisoner, recall that the gender prisoner is at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, and here's what her psychographic profile looks like. She's economically very unstable. If I had to use a couple of adjectives to describe her, uh, powerlessness and lack of autonomy characterize the gender prisoner. She is in sexual relationships where the choice of prevention products is driven by her partner's preferences, so she has little or no autonomy in her choices. Uh, she is in a relationship status where she has multiple sexual partners, often for very short periods of time. Uh, and she typically lives in an unstable home. Her economic instability has placed her in a very precarious situation. Her lack of know-how and her lack of power make her the most vulnerable of all the segments that we studied. For her, the key to adoption of HIV prevention products is that they be easily accessible and very covert. Why do they need to be covert? Because she needs protection without him knowing. 
Remember, she is in a power imbalance, and I was delighted to hear the previous presentation about power imbalance and sexual relationships. <coughs> she is in exactly that kind of relationship. So the packaging has to be extremely discreet and covert. And because this young, these young women don't have access to traditional healthcare outlets, uh, they would most be most reachable through mobile clinics, and uh, the product should be distributed through shabines and taverns. Uh, these women are not very active on social media. The best channel to reach them is through WhatsApp because that's uh, more prevalent uh, in that's more prevalent amongst them than Facebook. So let me conclude. Uh, I hope I've given you um, at least a taste of what we found. There's uh, an incredible level of depth in each one of these segments. Uh, we are following up with the analysis of our quantitative data, which includes uh, a survey, a detailed 40-minute survey of uh, 1,500 young women to cross-validate the typology, and I hope to present those results uh, perhaps next year at the AIDS conference. Uh, so to conclude this part of the study, uh, I think what we learned above all are the limitations of a one-size-fits-all approach. I started my presentation by saying that uh, we've had some spectacular failures, if I may characterize it as such, from major clinical trials where there was very low adherence and uptake of HIV prevention products that were, in fact, safe, but they didn't turn out to be effective. Uh, and the reason why these, one reason why these trials failed was because of the differing motivations, beliefs, and the socioeconomic conditions in which these women live, their experienced reality on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, our study highlights the central importance of the sociocultural context in product conceptualization and design, and also in promotion and marketing strategies. So what I'd like to leave you with is the thought that we talk a lot about precision medicine uh, with regard to treatments. We also need to be thinking about precision marketing and precision product positioning when it comes to the uptake of these highly personal, highly stigmatized products. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agarao, um, uh, for this uh, very strong uh, intervention that you actually uncovered here in, in, um, in your studies. So let's just try and keep our time because <laughs> we have 10 minutes for every presentation, and then we'll leave the rest to our colleagues and partners who are in this room. So let's just try and use our 10 minutes. So my, our next uh, presenter is um, Nico Ago, who is from the United States of America also. Dr. Nico Ago is a social uh, psychologist in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy and Social and Decision Science at Carnegie uh, Mellon University. So please welcome to the stage. And um, she is going to be presenting on uh, PrEP and mental models assessment for young, young African women, motivations and barriers to PrEP, initiation and adherence. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's also my first time to be at this conference, as well as my first time to give a 10-minute presentation. <laughs> but I see no reason why I shouldn't be able to hit it out of the ballpark, so, um, so I will do my best. I should, before, before starting, I should thank my collaborators who are listed in tiny print at the bottom of this slide. Um, the themes that I'll present to you today are taken from a manuscript in progress that we are co-authoring. So let me go pretty quickly through the background because I believe most in this room uh, will be familiar with it. Uh, essentially, young women in sub-Saharan Africa still have one of the highest HIV incidence rates. But despite that, uh, we've seen low use of biomedical HIV prevention tools in recent clinical trials. So there is a consensus around the need to better understand and meet user demand, and particularly to understand the context of young African women's lives and how PrEP would fit into them. So it's in that vein that the POWER project was conceived and funded. Um, POWER stands for Prevention Options for Women Evaluation Research. And it was funded by USAID and PEPFAR. Um, the idea was to do extensive formative research into the context of young women's lives 
and then to use that to develop innovative tools and strategies for subsequent demonstration projects, which would then be evaluated. Uh, so my role and the role of my team at Carnegie Mellon was to do part of that formative research. And we were tasked with understanding the motivators and obstacles for young African women's initiation and adherence to PrEP, taking their life context into account. So we asked, how do women construe their HIV risk versus other risks in their lives or versus the, the risks that PrEP would introduce to their lives? And what then is the value proposition of PrEP for those young women? Uh, we drew on decision science as a frame to help us answer this question. Decision science is a study of how people should make decisions. So if they were rational, this is like a normative analysis versus how people actually do make decisions, a descriptive uh, analysis. And then we use the gaps that we find between these to prescribe interventions that can help people make better decisions. There's a few reasons why what people should do is different from what they do do. Um, the first are perspective taking failures. So all of us uh, tend to have difficulty realizing how situational factors will influence our decision making. And then as experts, uh, you know, we contribute to a lot of communications failures. So we assume that our knowledge is intuitive to others and then communicate the wrong things. Or we over inform, which effectively freezes somebody. We might under inform because we know the power of numbers and we assume other people do as well. Uh, or we might apply a behavioral principle incorrectly. So a lot of us are familiar with the use of fear framing uh, to galvanize a population, but if those frames are used during times of loss or fear, it actually paralyzes them. And then lastly, uh, we are not rational animals. We operate according to biases and heuristics. I will not go through um, the long list of, of them which have been developed in the last 60 years, but I did highlight in blue a few that we thought would be critical to thinking about young African women in the context of PrEP. So uh, one, people have difficulty imagining themselves in other visceral states. So you, you think you're always gonna use condoms because you should, and then you're in the moment and you don't. Or you think PrEP is gonna be really difficult and it implies stigma and potential uncertainties, but then when you actually go through the process, it's not as bad as you thought. Um, there's affect, the affect heuristic, where we actually evaluate a stimulus according more to how we feel about it implicitly than to a uh, reflective analysis. There's the fact that we're present biased, which means we weight the costs and benefits of something in the present moment more than those costs and benefits in the future. And then, of course, in terms of choice, people may not know what they want, uh, especially when it comes to something novel like PrEP. So we used the mental models methodology for this research, which basically means we developed an expert model where we identified what people need to know to make informed decisions based off of expert uh, interviews. Then we developed a young African women's model where we identified what they know about PrEP and how they think they would make decisions about it. And then we do a, a gap analysis. This research was conducted at three sites, um, Cape Town, South Africa, our collaborators at the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation there, um, in Johannesburg, at the WITS Reproductive Health Institute, and in Kisumu, Kenya, at the Kenya Medical Research Health Institute. So we <coughs> conducted the research over about a year and a half, uh, beginning with an expert model in March 2016. We then spent about six months doing in-depth interviews at the three sites with young African women aged 16 to 25 who are sexually active, um, HIV negative, and fluent in English or a local language. We interviewed 48 women across the three sites, at least 15 at each site. And there were two interviews per participant, an hour for each interview, which enabled us to get really in depth about their lives and to develop a familiarity with the interviewer in order in that second interview to talk about extremely sensitive subjects. Um, we then <coughs> followed up with a survey with the, with the African women uh, about eight months later and there were 444 women, or sorry, 243 women surveyed. We also surveyed men. The goal with the survey was to establish the prevalence of beliefs and attitudes identified in the interviews and to correlate demographic relationships to them. So very quickly, our median age for the women was 20 years, 44%, um, so less than half had heard of PrEP, and only 5% knew anybody who had ever used PrEP. 
I am not going to walk you through this whole model, um, but it's important to say that the solid lines are uh, the links, the thematic links identified by experts, and the dotted lines were those links uh, that came up in the interviews with young African women. You will notice that a lot of themes in the literature are here. So the importance of um, finances into access to PrEP or how other healthcare services or interaction with providers can influence access. There's social stigma, um, influence of family, friends, et cetera, et cetera. I am going to focus on two major outcomes. Uh, one in the upper right corner, uncertainty and negative affect, which we saw as a result of several themes. Uh, young women's anticipated relationship consequences if they took PrEP, their inability to imagine the time span they would need to be on PrEP and then what that required them to think about in terms of where their life was going, um, their moral consternation over the possibility that they would engage in risk compensation, and then just logistical effort and difficulties uh, identifying how they would deal with, with logistics. So there's a lot of negative emotion there. Uh, and then also we'll talk about some risk perception issues. So in terms of risk in our gap analysis, uh, in contrast to what experts thought, these young women care deeply about their HIV risk. 84% of them said HIV be, would be worse for them than getting pregnant, primarily, primarily because they expected social exclusion. They also overestimated their HIV risk. So per single exposure, where objective risk is less than 1% for women, they perceived it to be 79% chance that they would get HIV from a single exposure. Um, they also, they understood some aspects of HIV and PrEP, uh, but not necessarily deeply. And this led to a troubling outcome. So in one subsample, you saw that the perceptions of high risk meant people thought they had come into contact with HIV, but they didn't get it. And because they had such a shallow understanding of um, of how HIV worked or how, uh, you know, how HIV worked really, they had to come up with their own story about why they didn't get it. So those stories took three forms. One was, I must be immune, so I have the immune soldiers to fight off HIV, which of course would lead to the idea that you don't need biomedical interventions. Another was divinity. My, because of my faith, God is protecting me which also leads, in addition to I don't need biomedical in, um, prevention, it leads to maybe other people's character or faith isn't strong enough to be protected. And then mistrust. Maybe the clinics and or the government have been lying to us and the risk isn't so much. Maybe they're just trying to influence our behavior. So that's problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, but I'm going to move forward uh, to the uncertainty and negative affect, the, the, the basically the negative present bias that, uh, that came from the umbrella of themes uh, involving relationship turbulence, the idea that uh, using PrEP could introduce trust issues into a relationship I care about. I'd have to lie to my family a lot, and I don't want to be that type of person. Or uh, what if I do have more sex or more unprotected sex because of this? What does that mean about who I am? Um, what does the future of my life look like? Will I be on this forever? Will I be, often these women are wearing situations of scarcity and structural barriers. Will I always be there? And that was difficult to think about. So, so why this is relevant, it's not just, oh, it feels bad. Um, but the idea, one thing we've shown in decision science is that our felt reactions to an issue occur automatically and sort of under the radar, but they subsequently influence the way in which we process a calculation or judge something. So if we feel negative about it, we might weigh uh, more strongly the costs. And if we feel positively, we might weigh the benefits more strongly. So I'm gonna skip through these quotes uh, for time. Um, it's important to note we also identified a lot of benefits, and in particular, affect, positive affect benefits. Um, so women talked about PrEP as being control, safety, strength, and conscientiousness, and this latter piece, I think, is more unique than the others which have been identified in the literature because a lot of these women got excited about being part of a vanguard of a new movement, of protecting other youth, building an, you know, you know, something new and positive for their generation or for their friends. Um, and so as much as I talked about negative affect and how that might undermine a calculation, the fact that there were this, these positive uh, sentiments, I think, is a nice mitigator. Um, these young women expressed strong interest in PrEP overall. So we asked twice in our survey 
about uh, PrEP interest the first time after just seeing a short blurb, PrEP can prevent HIV, you take it daily. And then we asked, are you interested in learning more? Um, 4.3 on a scale of uh, 1 to 5 was the average answer. So that's very strong. We then gave them more detailed information, such as what they would come into contact with in a clinic. And this looked at daily administration of PrEP, regular follow-up visits, the need to continue using condoms, and then asked, would they still be interested or would they be interested? And here we saw a slight fall, but it's still 3.8 out of, or, yeah, 3.8 out of 5. So that's pretty strong. We uh, performed an ordered logistic regression to look at what predicts a young woman's interest in trying PrEP in these areas and found that um, living in, Camp in Cape Town was a positive move vis-a-vis uh, -vis Johannesburg or Kisumu. Previous knowledge of PrEP, believing that you would use condoms less, perceiving that one would be able to take PrEP daily, so self-efficacy, um, and self-assessed one-year HIV risk all predicted uh, or increased one's interest in PrEP. So we found it interesting that um, age, frequency of sex or condom usage, or having side partners are suspecting that one main partner has sides. None of these influenced interest. I'm going to skip through this summary, uh, interest of time, but when we thought about how this might be useful for unrolling PrEP, we came to a few conclusions. First, in terms of marketing and branding, um, that folks should be aware of the affect heuristic and that it, it very likely is at play in young women's assessments of PrEP. So rather than trying to directly counter uncertainty or negative, negative um, affect for women dealing with the complex relationship or identity issues, we said employ positive effective images and branding. So empowerment, bravery, norms. Just go to the strengths of PrEP. Get people to think about whether it's right for them before they have to think about how to work it into their lives. In terms of counseling, um, single exposure is no uh, is of no use. I mean, it's created problems, I think, for uh, young African women and men in terms of if I've been exposed to, to HIV, why don't I have it? Uh, so to get away from that, think more about lifetime risk, talking about cumul cumulative risks. Um, in terms of counseling, I know that there is a hesitation in the medical world to, uh, to getting too complicated about mechanisms. But our takeaway was that it would be very helpful for youth to have scaffolding to understand how PrEP works. It could be pretty simple. But um, understanding HIV and PrEP will enable people to come up with better uh, stories or solutions for um, logistical issues that come up with taking it. Creating a decision tool could be a very useful um, strategy for clinics because it enables uh, young women to think through whether PrEP is right for them and whether their risk um, indicates it would be right for them without having to get into the effective complications I mentioned earlier. And in terms of delivery, I didn't, I didn't showcase this research here, but we, we did look at a variety of positive and negative factors we thought would influence uh, PrEP. We had people rate them. What we found is that there were virtually no hard stops. So even side effects, people would say, oh, I'm not going to take it if I have side effects. But as soon as they understood that they would go away in a couple weeks, they thought they could muddle through. Um, the only hard stops were financial and logistical. And so therefore, we think finding a way to overcome those, bringing PrEP services to the people, uh, is going to be really important. And then lastly, uh, I know that this has been discussed throughout, but PrEP-friendly health services, uh, whatever it takes to make sure that the stigma and, and mistreatment that goes along with coming into a clinic um, can, can go away would be helpful. Um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicole. Uh, for this presentation. Um, I hope that works out uh, in every part of the world. So I'm handing over to my colleague uh, to continue with our presentations and our presenters coming in. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kelvin. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bahati Kasimonje, who is from Zimbabwe. She is a master's level psychologist from the University of Witwatersrand who specializes in working with young people living with HIV. And Bahati is going to talk to us about experiences and outcomes of group psychotherapy as an ARV adherence support intervention among young people who are failing ART in Harare, Zimbabwe. Thank you, Nadia. 
Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to be presenting on experiences and outcomes of an adherent support group with young people in Zimbabwe. I have no conflicts to declare. So as we all know that adherence to art is a major challenge faced by young people living with HIV. They usually have this um, lower rates of suppression and retention in care. And this we see in our cohort at Newlands Clinic, where our young people have the lowest suppression rates. And by suppression rates at Newlands Clinic, it's below 50 copies per mil. If we take a look at the graph, we can see that those from 13 to 24 have the lowest suppression rates, particularly those who are between 15 and 24 um, years of age. There's limited evidence to inform which strategies work and for who, and so this study examined um, an adherence support intervention in young people who were supposed to be switched to, first, to second line after failing on first line. So we had young people who had confirmed virological failure. And these are young people who, during routine care, have received adherence counseling from their respective nurses. So some attended EACGI and some did not attend. This is available for all our young people, but attendance to these sessions are not compulsory. We then followed up all these young people over a period of a year and routine bloods were taken at three months, six months, nine months, and at 12 months. So what is EACGI? It's a 12-week curriculum. It's semi-structured where we have different biopsychosocial topics. So it's not just about HIV literacy, but we also focus on what's happening socially, what's happening psychologically, and invite young people to also talk about um, the different topics they would like discussed with regards to their adherence. We use motivational interviewing, CBT, and phenomenological um, principles. The sessions are about one and a half hours long. In the last 30 minutes, they share a meal together, a small snack together. And they are about 8 to 15 in a group. And again, we follow them up for a year. And this also involves peer counselors following up during routine visits on how they're finding adherence after the intervention. So I'll just speak more into motivational interviewing. What we're trying to do is to eliminate the discrepancy, should I adhere, should I not, and help adolescents come to a decision that is healthy for them. Phenomenological, we are looking at their own experiences. Often there's HIV messaging around, this art is good for you, you should take your art, but we want to find out from the adolescents themselves how they're experiencing taking art, what are their difficulties, what is the experience of living with HIV. There's also a lot of psychoeducation on how their thoughts and their feelings affect their behavior. So how they think about art, how they feel about art, how it impacts on their taking of art. So our results, we had 59 who were to, due to be switched to second line. 37 of these attended EACGI and 22 did not attend. And of those who did not attend, the blue line indicates their suppression rates over the year. And as you can see, they had less than 50% suppression rates on second line. And for those in the orange line, those attended EACGI, EACGI for at least three quarters of the session. And again, the suppression rates are lower than those who attended more sessions of EACGI across the year that we followed them up. So for those who attended EACGI, part of the discussions that we had were about what are their barriers to poor adherence. And among these, those who attended, they spoke about hopelessness. And the hopelessness was mainly linked to socioeconomic factors. So I take my ARVs then what? What can I do with my life? Um, can I get a job? And this facilitated poor adherence. There's also a lot of family dysfunction, a lack of monitoring, and a lack of support. Young people have a present bias, as discussed in presentations, and so a lack of illness facilitated the thought that, well, if I'm okay, I can give myself a drug holiday and not have to take my ARVs consistently. 
There's also an aversion to a, a daily routine attached to stigma. There's still a lot of stigma with regards to HIV, and so taking a pill every day reminded them of this, as well as the medication side effects deterred adherence. I'm just going to go through a few quotes from the group. These are quotes from young females and males who attended EACGI. They spoke of HIV as being death, you're of no use, you're isolated, neglected, and discriminated. There's no longer a future. They remind you that you're worthless and sick, and do, but they do help the immune system. Right? Again, there's a negative attachment to HIV and adherence that it's, it's fear, skin disease, desperation, death, home based care, sickbed. And this was a young lady who talked about how she was told her skin would improve, but she did not see the benefits um, after taking her art, and she stopped because of that. And so body image is important for young women. And then another young person said, it is difficult to take pills every day because we are young. We forget. You also feel different, and you feel ashamed. So in conclusion, those who attended... EACGI had better second-line virological outcomes than those who attended less or none at all. And we believe that EACGI is a promising tool for preparing young people, particularly when you want to switch them. The study was conducted using routine data, and so we did not randomize those who went to EACGI and those who didn't. And so they, they are underlying biases there but we still believe that it is a promising tool that people can use in their clinics with regards to preparing young people to take their art. And I'd like to acknowledge all the young people for their time and their wisdom for coming for EACGI and the Newlands Clinic staff team. Thank you. So thank you very much, Bahati, for sharing your experiences and findings on EACGI in Zimbabwe. Uh, I'll hand over to Kelvin to introduce our last speaker. Uh, thanks, Badi. And um, I would like to welcome uh, Elona Tosca, who is from uh, South Africa. Uh, Elona works closely with a team of multidisciplinary researchers, policymakers, and program implementers to conduct relevant research that can improve sexual reproductive health of adolescents, especially those living with HIV. She is based in the University of Cape Town and Oxford. On her presentation, she will be presenting on the third generation of HIV, world's first uh, longitudinal study of pregnancy in adolescents living with HIV. So help me welcome Ilona to the stage. Thank you, everyone. And I must thank my co-presenters because I was told that they all had to cut their presentations down by two minutes. So time could be made for this late breaker abstract. So thank you, everyone. And um, today I will share with you in 10 minutes more of a, a taster of what is to come and uh, so, some research that builds on the work on colleagues in the room and that focuses on um, perhaps a, a new uh, group of young women that we should pay a bit more attention to. And Professor Lorraine Scher, uh, sitting in the audience, has worked on this analysis and study together with a few other colleagues um, sitting here. Why worry about adolescent pregnancy and adolescent young women living with HIV? Well, we'll have lots of them soon, um, as we all know about the population bulge and about turning um, our youth um, growth into a dividend. And adolescent young women are stuck in an in a intergenerational circle of early adversity, which then feeds into um, some of these difficulties passing on to their children, and therefore the cycle repeats itself for the future generations. So we really need to figure out, sooner rather than later, what can we do to break this cycle of disadvantage? And of course, um, this is even more imperative for adolescents, uh, girls living with HIV, because as we keep hearing, the new infections amongst 15 to 24 year olds are continuing to increase despite our best efforts. So these young women are there and they want, we need to help them. They also, we know already um, from multiple studies here that they have worse maternal and child outcomes. They have worse antenatal care access and utilization, 
uh, higher maternal mortality and morbidity, higher HIV transmission rates to their children, almost double um, in compared to the national in South Africa, for example, and worse postpartum retention in care, particularly in option B+. And we know that when they're already in care or once they learn about their status, um, as they found out that they're pregnant, they actually have worse ART, PMTCT retention in care. And the programs that try to actually keep them in care, and we have a few good examples from, from our region, they actually seem to work less effectively or not at all for young women. Specifically from the area where a study was conducted, we find that um, young women under one, 21 years old that were living with HIV were 3.3 times more likely to have had an unwanted pregnancy. So not only um, are these young women finding out their status in their first pregnancy, but these pregnancies were generally unwanted and unplanned. What I haven't put here is that in our sample, for example, over 65% of the young girls living with HIV already from the age of um, being, they're all under 19 at baseline, wanted to have two or more children. Why is this relevant? First of all, being HIV positive is not affecting their childbearing ideation. Second, even though they're coming and having a child already, we are actually failing them before they have a second child, which is part of their fertility ideation. They're entering, a, we hope, 30 years of healthy reproduction cycles, and we need to pay attention to that. So today I'll quickly answer these four questions. The data that I'll use is primarily from a study called the mzanzi wako cohort study, and it's a three-year follow-up of adolescents. They were 10 to 19 years old at baseline. It was conducted in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa, and we followed them up three times, though the data I'll share with you today is only from the first two waves because we're still cleaning up the third wave. I'll, I can talk about methods separately or later, so forgive me if I'm, if I'm rushing through. What this study showed us is that finding adolescent mothers, but especially HIV positive adolescent mothers, those living with HIV, was very difficult, even though providers told us that there were many of them and they're really struggling um, in reaching good um, health outcomes for themselves and their children. So we actually designed a second study called Hey Baby, which is actually Professor Lauren Schurz and Lucy Kluver's uh, brilliant acronym that stands for, let me see if I can remember, and I'll test you with, for this at the end of this uh, talk, but it's help empower youth brought up in adversity with their babies and young children. Did everyone get that? Hey, baby? But it's, it's a serious matter, and we're trying to actually find 700 adolescent mother-child um, dyads, um, and about a third of them, we estimate, will, have been, um, will be HIV positive or living with HIV. So what have we found? This is looking at 550 HIV positive um, adolescent girls. 17% of them have ever had a pregnancy, and 6% of them um, re reported getting pregnant in the last year, so between our two interviews. Now, it's 6% of the total 540, but it's actually a higher proportion of um, those who already had a child, and you'll see that the repeated pregnancies, while it is 3%, it's actually a third of those who already had a child. So amongst those who had initiated childbearing, a third got pregnant again. What, is, what the colors are actually showing here is that the highest burden of them is amongst sexually infected um, adolescents living with HIV, or as our colleague Sarah Bernays recently appealed to us to call them recently infected adolescent girls, so we're not stigmatizing them. Professor Lucy Kluver and I have also looked at some other features that are particularly worrying in our sample. So 44% stopped taking ART while they're pregnant, 23%, one in four are mixed feeding their child, Two-thirds of them are reported missing at least one dose in the last three days. 17% of them did not know the status of their child, and 4.4% told us that they had at least one HIV-positive child, and we're still following up with them on the individual data. But that is nearly twice the rate of uh, mother-to-child transmission or parent-to-child transmission in South Africa as of now. What's happening with their other outcomes? On, the, on your left, in the blue bars, you can see a comparison of four subgroups. Um, adolescent girls who were not pregnant or mothers, HIV-positive adolescent girls, um, adolescent mothers, and then the last bar, adolescent mothers living with HIV. And you can see that when it comes to school, there is an interaction effect. Adolescent mothers living with HIV have a much higher rate of, of dropping out. So not only they're doing poorly because they, they've become mothers, which is not surprising to many of us in the field, but there's something about living with HIV that is making it harder to return to school or is making them drop out of school. And you can see on the right in the green bars that they're also experiencing poor um, 
health services quality. They're getting shouted at for having sex. They feel providers are angry at them. But this seems to be driven primarily by becoming a mother. And of course, pregnancy is very uh, difficult to avoid visibly. It's easy to stigmatize against it because you are it's there in front of you. So I, we think that that is in part why nurses also or providers uh, find it easier to um, to communicate with the, these young women in such a way that they feel um, shouted at. We also find that whatever sexual risk taking may have gotten them infected, particularly in the case of the recently infected young women, is persisting afterwards. So you can see to the left that um, Young mothers are uh, continuing to engage in transactional sex, which may have been the reason why they were, became pregnant in the first place. But being positive or living with HIV and being a mother um, interacts when it comes to older um, sexual, having older sexual partners. And we're still trying to understand what this is. And this sample is relatively small, as you, as you may recall uh, from the, the prevalence data. And then we try to understand what is actually happening. We know that psychosocial vulnerabilities, mental health distress and mental health issues is associated um, together with structural drivers in shaping HIV infection. And these are rates of four mental health um, issues uh, comparing the HIV positive adolescent girls. The, part, the bars in red are those who did not have a pregnancy in the last year and those in blue are incident pregnancy. So those who got pregnant between the two waves. And you can see um, fairly large differences in, and significant differences in terms of rates when it comes to PTSD and trauma and rates of depression. There were no differences when it comes to anxiety and we know that that can work a bit differently when it comes to safe sex. Um, and the rates were a bit higher with, for suicidal ideation, but it, this was not significant. We then put these mental health and psychosocial vulnerabilities in a model, in a, uh, in a regression model, controlling for baseline pregnancy to see what was associated with incident pregnancy in the, in the last year, so between our two interviews. We included factors such as age, uh, rural residence, informal housing, uh, other markers of poverty, orphanhood, these mental health issues, mode of infection, and whether they'd, had, they'd been in school consistently, since that seems to be a strong predictive factor. And what we find here is that um, if mental health issues are in fact associated with incident pregnancy, they seem to be operating through several different factors and three specifically. I'm just going to walk you through these marginal effect models. So these are probabilities of reporting incident pregnancy in between the two interviews. So lower bars are better, we want them to be low. So from the left, you can see that consistent school enrollment even for um, recently infected adolescent girls is better, it's protective. And adolescent girls who are recently infected and have dropped out of school or in fact weren't in school or throughout the entire study are much more likely to report a pregnancy in the last year. But uh, adolescent women, I mean, I try to remember when I was one, um, I, I forever feel like I'm 17 plus many years of experience, but they don't want to be defined by risk profiles and by um, stigmatizing practices. So we ask them what they want. And these are just sample um, things that they told us that they wish they could have from Uganda, Sierra Leone, and South Africa. We have teen advisory groups in, in these three countries. And uh, you can see some of the visuals are repeated. So the black, the, the black um, silhouettes with a white background that's like family and parenting training support. The, the healthcare providers in green are friend, uh, adolescent and teen responsive healthcare providers. And uh, the sex of money are the requests for jobs and employment. These young people, um, these were both men and women who had become parents, do not want to be defined by these risk profiles. They want to be helped to become fully realized human beings. And I really welcome your thoughts on how we can do this and how we can shape our future analysis because this is extremely preliminary. And if you are a teen mom or father yourself and, or were one and you want to tell me more about it, please come and find me at the end. This would not be possible without um, all the people that are part of the study in the Eastern Cape and in the different universities that we work together, our funders and young people, um, and all of you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, this uh, is actually one of our last presentation. Uh, and this wonderful panel of uh, powerful women. <laughs> and uh, we're opening it up uh, to the floor where we expect questions. 
and uh, hopefully we'll get answers from people who did uh, these studies. So I open it up to the floor. Hello, um, my name is Donna Futterman and I'm from uh, the Adolescent AIDS Program in New York, US. Uh, excellent panel. I would love to say something to each one of you, ask a question, but I will, uh, I will limit my remarks to the colleague from Zimbabwe. Um, I also have found through various projects that having a structured support group in which you move people along a continuum from what their issues are to some of the solutions is really important. That having support groups that just sort of let the, te let the attendees structure it really is not as effective as having a curriculum-based design that you talked about. Um, so thank you for the work. I was wondering if you had any issues or lessons learned from recruitment and retention. One of the biggest challenge of curriculum groups is getting people back for multiple sessions. So what did you do to retain them in the sessions and did you have any issues about recruitment? And again, thank you all. This was a very instructive uh, panel, each one of your studies. Thank you for your question. So in terms of retention, yes, you're right. Um, having young people attend many sessions is a bit difficult, but what we have started to do is they form a WhatsApp group within themselves and they encourage each other to come. Um, so in the beginning, I do say that if they have any difficulties or any problems with coming, if they can talk to me, but in the end, it's the peers themselves who encourage each other to come. So they check, have you got on the bus? Have you, but that's all through WhatsApp. So they form a WhatsApp group um, outside of the EACGI. My name is Constance Mack with Yang from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I just want to repeat thanks for a really interesting panel of a lot of sort of current research that's just coming out. My question is to Ritu. Um, you, you were speaking in the context that most of our narratives about vulnerability are inextricably linked with poverty. And you've shown, and I've also seen in research in Zambia, that they're relatively high privileged, relatively high income young women who are also at uh, high risk of <coughs> HIV. And I'm wondering um, how your typologies maybe can be used to shift our perception of vulnerability in this circumstance. Thank you for the question and thank you for also highlighting that some of the assumptions that we've held about South African women may need to be challenged. Uh, and that was precisely the point of the study. Uh, we wanted to uncover that there are these um, nuanced descriptions of women that have not been paid attention to either in the literature or in any one of the prevention studies that we've conducted. So your point is, uh, you know, absolutely right on, that there are very pri privileged young women uh, who are extremely high risk because of the social media influences and other kinds of influences that, that they're exposed to. And we have to remember that South Africa is a country that's undergoing uh, you know, a major economic as well as a social revolution. So they're coming out of patriarchy. Women are learning to discover themselves. They are finding about, about their sexuality. They're more willing to express their preferences. And all of this is creating uh, a lot of um, uh, what I would call instances of vulnerability in sexual activities. So thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Snell. I'm working with M4ID in Helsinki, Finland. I have two questions. The first is for Dr. Philbin. Uh, I was really interested in all of the data uh, that you presented and I was in, it found it interesting that you didn't mention mental health, and so I wonder if you looked at that. Um, and then my second question is for Ilona. Um, I wonder if you have asked the girls how they feel about those pregnancies um, to see if they're not using pregnancy as a way of feeling more empowered and happy. 
Sorry, I wasn't sure. I'll, I'll start. Um, no, that's a great question, actually. And we did look at it initially in the bivariate analyses, and we didn't see a relationship, which was interesting. And it may be simply because of the way that we were powered, in all honesty, because of the relatively small sample size. So we actually have another Adolescent Trials Network study that was going on simultaneously that has a larger sample, and we're starting to do additional analyses with that and are going to look. We don't have the incarceration questions aren't quite as nuanced, so we can't look at them in the same way, but we are gonna try to see if there are other relationships between incarceration and mental health outcomes and also incarceration and viral load. Thank you, that's a great question. And actually, a colleague of ours at University of Cape Town, Alison Swartz, has done quite a lot of really rich um, qualitative work on, on early fertility, so not a blaming phrase, and I'm hoping to kind of be informed and inspired by that as we do further analysis. The young women in our sample reported that over 90% of the pregnancies that I presented on were unplanned and unwanted at the time. Now, once they had a child, we, uh, we don't have that data yet, but the Hey Baby study, which I'm going, I mentioned I would test you on later, is actually ongoing and asks them about experiences of parenthood. So how they're dealing with being a parent and um, how their uh, mental health is after that and experiences of, of parenting, like par parental stress and parental well-being. So we'll stay tuned. We'll share that soon. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lera Tomufoke. I'm from the South African Youth Council as well as a sector youth leader um, at SANIC level. Um, I'd like to just firstly appreciate the presentation that was made by all the panelists. It was very informative and also thought-provoking. But the question that I want to raise, perhaps to start from Dr. Gara going uh, down to the last presenter, is to ask how can we perhaps engage boys and men uh, to address these new infections and teenage pregnancy because these young girls and these young women, they are not having or engaging in sexual intercourse by themselves, but they are, they are involved with boys. So I think perhaps we are talking a lot about what they are not doing and what the challenges are, but what are we actually saying about the boys and the men themselves? Thank you very much. Let me uh, make a comment on that. Uh, that's an excellent point, and we tried to uncover some of that in our study in the last set of qualitative data that we collected, where we had young women with their partners uh, conversing together with the researchers. Uh, one of the next steps uh, in our ethnographic work that we're exploring is to specifically target uh, men to understand what their motivations and beliefs are and whether they, in fact, could be the drivers of uh, spreading HIV prevention products amongst the women that they interact with. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. We have a very low number of adolescent fathers in our sample, so quantitatively it's a bit difficult to come up with, with conclusions, but we are conducting qualitative work with them, and of course, the adolescent women in our sample are not all falling pregnant with, with younger, with their peers. Some of them are falling pregnant with older partners, and we haven't yet, it's very difficult to recruit those partners in a quantitative study. Um, but um, it's very good food for thought. Thank you for a great question. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for your presentations. My name is Jenny Vivani. Um, I work with the Institute of Human Biology, Nigeria. And my question is for Dr. Elona. Um, about two months ago in Nigeria, I tried to look at the percentage of HIV positive pregnant adolescents. And even though I didn't do a lot, but I didn't see a lot of them. I saw very few. So I, want, I saw pregnant adolescents, but I didn't see HIV positive pregnant adolescents in the few facilities I tried to review. So I want to find out how did you find the number of pregnant positive adolescents you found out? And also, now, I'm now thinking in the line that we don't have positive pregnant adolescents. Can we start looking at trying to help them to prevent pregnancy? That's tackling the first prong of PMTCT. Like, they, like the session we had yesterday, the youth said, don't tell us, don't tell adolescents to abstain from sex. We want to have sex. Pray to us that we should use condom. We should refer, but don't tell us not to have sex. So can we look at, should we try to prevent pregnancy among the positive adolescents. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. That, those are both excellent questions. Well, the second more of an appeal, and I couldn't agree more with you. I think the only way we can prevent unplanned and unwanted pregnancies is to help young women of all different uh, wakes of life have healthy, safe, and uh, enjoyable sexual lives. With regards to your first question, in South Africa we have, at least in the last um, prevalence survey, because I, the, the new one is out and I haven't actually, I don't recall the exact number, but we had an 11% prevalence amongst antenatal care uh, women that were under 19 years old. So that tells you kind of what the incidence of, of HIV is in that rate. So one in 10 pregnant women, uh, adolescent, pregnant adolescents would be HIV positive. In our study, we found them by going to 72 facilities. So it's a, it's a whole municipality, and we started by finding first all uh, adolescents living with HIV, and so we didn't purposefully choose the, the pregnant ones in there, and we've then sort of recruited more of their peers. So we're doing something that uh, we call systematic sampling, which means we go and find them wherever they could be, including um, schools and churches and communities because we know that many young mothers don't show up at facilities until they're about to give birth and then drop off the system. So wherever you and the two or three young women you can find in your community tell you they are, it's, if it's hair saloons, they'll be there. You, you can, you'd have to think outside of the facilities. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm Vera Paiva from Brazil, working with all with teenagers and young people for a long time. So, and this was really, really a good panel. Thank you for inspiring research. I have one question for maybe to Nicole or and Ritu. I don't know, but I would do it for all of you. Um, I'm wondering if, for example, from Ritu's work. Uh, or what you tell us, you show how the model one size fits all doesn't work for young women, and this is an old discovery in the AIDS field, and you show the diversity, but you end up talking about marketing, and, uh, <clears throat> and also from your, for example, I think it's for all of you, I would love to hear from you about that. I have a problem of social psychologists, for example, or, or people who think about, who can't think about intervention, ending up with a marketing approach, you know, which uh, is not really putting people uh, as agents, as subjects in a citizenship way of thinking. And I was wondering what mediation would you suggest from your data to the intervention? I, I, if you have any kind of uh, experiments or thoughts of input from the community who've been working you, with you and how to use this data, not through marketing. <laughs> I'm, I'm just using this as a, an example, right? But uh, uh, how, do you have things thought about that? And thank you for the great panel. So, let me quickly clarify what we mean by marketing. Uh, essentially, the problem that we were trying to address is that even though these products are useful for the women, as we might say, being biomedical scientists, that these are important products for these women to use, unfortunately, there's a chasm between the availability of their products and their adoption. So when we talk about marketing, it's really about what kinds of interventions will motivate and persuade these women, these young girls that we're trying to influence, that these products are useful for them and that they should adopt them. So that's the sense in which we're using marketing. And to your point about what are the specific interventions, you know, absolutely. So what would be the next step that follows up on the qualitative work? It would be to look at what are the channels, what are the different um, uh, uh, social influences that could be used to persuade these women to destigmatize the use of the products, to allow them to be uh, more self-determined in their choice of prevention methods, to take them away from the power imbalance that they feel with their partners. So, so the, um, uh, the typology is not an end in and of itself, but it is to help guide the design of interventions and then you know, follow up uh, randomized trials that would allow us to determine what would be the specific outcomes of those interventions. Okay, uh, thank you, Doc. 
Yeah, I think uh, we, we are running out of time, but we'll just give you 20 seconds. <laughs> and so that we can allow our two people on the floor to actually give, uh, give out their questions. And we'll just give you one minute each, and then 20 seconds to, to, to people responding. Operating Thank you. under scarcity. Okay. Um, so then, really quick, I have thought about this a lot. Um, and I'm going to offer hypotheses because we haven't tested any of this. But, but my dream test would be to do a, a collective action kind of norm based mm -hmm. uh, intervention. Why do I say that? I talked a lot about present bias in our study and about the need to feel positive, to feel good when your life is tough and you know, it's structural barriers and emotional barriers and instability. So the thing about PrEP is if we can find a way socially to make it be a win, right? So imagine that you're creating an initiative with a group of other people. And every time you see each other, you're getting oxytocin and dopamine. Um, you're lifting each other up in that. And I'm not just talking about a group. I'm actually talking about a norm intervention. So in another domain of actually um, bullying in schools, we've recently shown multi-million dollar projects, I should add, that if you, can, if you can determine what the network is and figure out who the hubs are, right, who are the informal leaders and influencers, and work with them voluntarily uh, to take on new behaviors, to champion them, not necessarily vocally or in a, in a traditional way, but just to do things differently, healthily. Uh, we see more change. Why? People feel better following and getting rewards from their peer network than for other reasons, right? And on the other hand, even if they're not feeling great, people act based on norms more than attitudes or beliefs. So I feel like this is a really... Um, an area of strong potential for looking at behavior change in Southern Africa and maybe everywhere, to be honest. But it takes a li little bit more money and a little bit more time. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yvette Rafael, and I'm from South Africa. I must say I was unpleasantly surprised by getting the data and the results here and have n not having heard some of the results, because almost 80%, if not all, except the Zimbabwean uh, study was done in South Africa. Uh, I want to know what are the plans to get these results out in the country, and what is the working relationship with the South African National AIDS Council? Because when we go to the South African AIDS, National AIDS Council presentations, a different picture is painting, so it looks like there's a plan or some kind of idea that everything is okay that side, and when we go into sessions, we find out these study results. Also, I would have loved to uh, have at least one presentation of why the other countries or where HIV is not so prevalent, what makes the young girl not so vulnerable. I just want solutions, and what we're getting from South Africa now issues is continuous uh, problems. So what are the solutions? I see with risk profile, the powerful young woman now, she's also now at risk. So I'd like, I'd like just to hear from the panelists who did the studies in South Africa, what are your plans to release it to the South African government, National AIDS Council, and also to young people uh, who are having, who are part of this. I like the very nice uh, change of words in describing my children, by the way, and uh, not unwanted and all of that. And also, I was a little bit disturbed that somebody would actually think that a young girl in South Africa would use pregnancy to feel more empowered. Twenty seconds. I would be very happy to talk to you more. Thank you for bringing up this this topic. In fact, um, we're presenting some of the more positive findings at the Senec meeting at six thirty this evening. So please, please join there. 
Um, I'll just quickly focus on this pregnancy data. It's very recent and we just analyzed it. And as you know, some of the findings here are embargoed. But some of the prior um, findings, we're working very closely with the Department of Basic Education and Social Development and Health in South Africa and SANAC. And they do, um, at least several members of the working groups have the findings. How we trickle this down to people who can make a difference is a question we're all working on together, I'm sure, but um, I'd welcome additional thoughts. At the moment, we're sharing them in working groups and policy briefs and, and lots of meetings. Um, I've been to Joburg about five times in the last six months to share these findings, so um, hopefully we can do it better in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry we're going to have to wrap up this session because of time, but what I'd like to say is if you notice the title of this session, um, it's, it has the word youth quick, meaning that we really have to shake things up and change how we see the HIV epidemic among young people. And you will see from the presentations here that we didn't have really the, the, what you usually expect in biomedical uh, um, uh, research presentations. Most of the presentations here had to do with psychosocial aspects, psychological aspects, behavioral science, and all the methods that behavioral scientists, which I'm not, um, use to um, help um, to improve the interventions we are devising uh, for young people. So the point of this session is not really to say here is another drug or here is another biomedical intervention, but as some of them have shown, how do we marry what is being done with biomedical interventions with behavioral and psychological studies to make these interventions of value to our target population and to make, help the target population be able to make decisions that can increase the uptake of these very useful interventions. So it's, I think it's a really important aspect of what we do in HIV uh, prevention and treatment to make sure that behavioral science and psychological you know, uh, studies are also really a high standard in helping to make sure that things go the way that we intend them to. So I really appreciate all our panelists. I appreciate my co-chair, uh, Kelvin, and I really think that the work you're doing is very important. I really believe in, in social marketing and segmentation of your target population to make sure that the intervention that we have so much evidence for is actually being taken up by our target population. So thank you all for attending, and our panelists, I think, will be available for further discussion or questions. Thank you very much.